All right, let me uh, pray for us then, and then we'll jump in, okay? So, Lord, we're thankful for this new day. Uh, we're thankful um, for your mercies that we find today. Uh, thank you for um, your grace to us as well. Uh, thank you for um, already the experience of those things today as we uh, wake up and have uh, good health, at least good enough to get us here, and uh, transportation, warm homes, and um, uh, nice facilities to uh, gather together. And so we're thankful, Lord, for all of those things. Uh, in addition to those things, we're thankful uh, that we have you, uh, that you and your grace have uh, reached down to us and have brought uh, us salvation in the person of Jesus. So we're thankful for that. Uh, that means that your uh, spirit is with us today and dwelling in us, but too, as we gather together in the name of Jesus. And so we thank you for that. Thank you, too, for your word. Um, it's our uh, lamp and our light, and we're desperate for it in a dark world. Um, like ours that we live in, so thank you for it. Thanks for the time together. Uh, we acknowledge that as um, we're here and enjoying this time together, that uh, there are some who aren't able to because of the physical um, difficulties that they're going through right now. And so for uh, Fred and uh, Cheryl, we're thankful, Lord, that you have uh, continued to um, be with them and uh, that they are showing some signs of improvement, and we pray that that would continue to be the case for them. And as they are um, looking like they're getting uh, better, we're mindful of uh, Aaron and Debbie uh, Kavanaugh, as Debbie's been hospitalized with COVID for some time now, and we understand that the issues I'm sure with them um, are uh, even more pressing, as uh, Debbie's so far along with um, her pregnancy, and so we pray that you would strengthen uh, not only her body, but her child's as well. And uh, we pray that you would give the doctors uh, continued wisdom and care as they, as they uh, treat Debbie. Um, we ask for Aaron and the kids as um, they, I'm sure, feel like they're scrambling. Um, we just ask that you would give them grace and measure of peace as uh, they trust in you. Uh, remind them that as they do so, bring these things to you in prayer that you will uh, guard them in Christ. And so we pray that that reality would grant them a uh, measure of peace in um, the midst of uh, the difficulty that they find themselves in now. For our sister Claudia, and she uh, travels to uh, Ann Arbor um, on Tuesday, we ask um, that you would grant her request and provide some safety um, for her there and back, and that you would um, just bless uh, this time uh, that she has um, uh, with uh, uh, some doctor's appointments, I believe, and so we pray that you would uh, let those um, go well. Um, for uh, all the other classes right now that are meeting, from Rooted, Resolve, to Marks Across the Gym, and ours now, Lord, we pray that you'd help us. Um, we thank you again for your word, and we just ask that your spirit would take the truths, uh, some that we are really familiar with, um, some that are um, beginning to dawn on us, but wherever we find ourselves um, uh, in those areas, we pray that your spirit would again help us today. Uh, see Christ's name we pray. All right. Yeah, thank you, Becky. You like the joyful noise, but, you know, it's not right now. All right, so, um, if you were here last week, uh, and you'll recall we got into Lesson 9, um, which really introduces the Jaker. Um, uh, but... Um, just coming out of that class last week and thinking through some things, I wanted to uh, extend Lesson 9, so we're doing Lesson 9 continue, um, uh, mainly because I think some of the ideas that we looked at last week, uh, particularly dealing with um, the idea of the Jaker, uh, kind of felt like a fire hydrant that opened up and blasted, so I just want to make sure that um, we're together, at least in seeing where this uh, concept is at in the Word. So, um, what we're going to do today is we're going to visit some other places uh, in Scripture to talk about um, what we looked at in Philippians chapter 3, just so that you um, can see with your own eyes where this is in Scripture. And uh, then when we pray for this, um, we can pray um, more uh, with more knowledge and understanding as to what we actually are praying about when we're talking about what it means to be a Christian. 
uh, following Jesus um, in everyday life, specifically that idea of um, dying and rising with Jesus in everyday life, okay? So, um, we are going to begin, though, back in Philippians chapter 3. So, if you have your Bibles, meet me there. Philippians chapter 3. So as you see on the screen here, before we read um, verses 7, or actually, um, yeah, verses 7 to 11 again, just want to remind us of uh, this truth. So the J curve, again, the, the picture of the J, got in your mind, we're dying, we just did it backwards, dying and rising with Jesus in everyday life. Uh, our author of our study, Paul Miller, uh, sees that really all throughout the Apostle Paul's writings, but uh, really in the book of Philippians. Uh, and his point in doing that is to help us to see that the gospel is not just something we believe, but something that we enter. Okay, so it's, it is something that we believe, right? We believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and we're saved, but it's more than just to believe, it's something that we enter into. Okay, and this gets to his concept that he introduced a few chapters about uh, chapters ago about where we locate ourselves. Uh, the reality that everybody is either in Christ or where? Harvard. And, and yeah, some, something else. Did you say Harvard? Yeah, good. In Harvard, in your family, in your career, and what people think of you. So you're either in Christ or you're not. Right? But everybody is in something. So that's true. And that helps us as we, um, that helps us individually uh, as followers of Jesus uh, throughout the week, um, as we live out our faith, but it also helps us as we um, share our faith with others. Because sometimes talking about being in Jesus feels pretty floaty and frankly kind of weird if you're talking to an unbeliever about your identity. My identity is in Jesus. Okay, they may be familiar with Jesus, especially at this time of year, but what in the world does that mean? So, uh, one of the objectives of the study is, is bringing our Christian faith um, uh, from out there sometimes in vague, floaty terms, love, Jesus, faith, Christian, down to earth, so that you can uh, grab it and feel it for yourself and then communicate it to others. And one of the ways that we do this is this language of location. So, where are you in? Where do you locate yourself? Well, that's the biblical doctrine and reality of I'm united with Christ. And if I'm united to Christ, that's where I am. And if that's where I am, then my relationship with God is I'm in Christ. I don't lack anything. Yeah. Right? And then out of that, so because of my relationship with God through Christ, I live out of that. And I engage with others in a way that Jesus tells us to. In the way that we've been engaged with by God. Okay? So... All that to say the apostle sees the gospel as not just something we believe, but something we enter. In other words, the gospel not only gives us a foundation for life, which we looked at in the previous lessons, foundation for our life is justification by faith, but it gives us the very shape of our lives. Okay, so less, I guess you could say it this way, less compartments. You know, on Sunday I do this, but on the rest of the week I kind of, you know, pick and choose. And more, no, no, being a Christian means that the shape of my life looks like the gospel, right? So um, that's what discipleship is. It's a lifelong learning of bringing Jesus and his commandments into every facet of my life, right? That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple, learning what it means to have Jesus influence every aspect of my life. Son, daughter, friend, employee, employer, grandma, grandpa, uh, all across the board, okay? So it gives us this shape, and the J-curve helps us see how that shape comes about, okay? This idea of dying and rising with Jesus in everyday life, okay? So, um, if you look with me at Philippians chapter 3, let me read verses 7 through 11 again. We're going to focus again today on... Um, this language that Paul uses as a fellowship of suffering. Okay, so what is what does that mean? And the point of that is because, again, he's trying to help us to see that believing the gospel, being a Christian, is more than just I believe this, it's entering into this. 
it gives, the sh gives you, if you're a Christian, um, the sh a shape to your life. So Paul says, beginning in verse 7, uh, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. You notice the language of location there? Okay, I don't want to be found in all that other stuff, right? He wants to be found in him, in Jesus, verse 9. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith, again, location, in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him, okay, and the power of his resurrection, and may, what, share his sufferings, becoming what, like him, like him in his death, that by any means, I, uh, by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Okay, so Paul is talking um, about his own life as a Christian and to these Christians in uh, Philippi, their life is shaped by the cross, what Christ has done. This idea of knowing, this idea of sharing, and this idea of becoming like him in his death. So what in the world does that mean for us as Christians on a Tuesday? So that's where we're trying to go with with this um, study. So, um, this idea, when, we talk, when Paul talks about a fellowship of suffering, uh, when he talks about it, that is the Apostle Paul, when he talks about knowing, sharing, and becoming like Jesus in his suffering and death, he's talking about something that is sometimes missing from how we think about being in Jesus. Okay, so he's not saying that across the board that everybody lives like this, but he, our author, is um, stating that uh, in his experience as a uh, minister and his own life as a Christian, um, something uh, is sometimes missing from how we think about being in Jesus. And that something that's missing is connecting our stories with Jesus's. Okay, so... Um, if you can just uh, for a minute think about your own um, your your own story, the story of your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, uh, what that looks like. Uh, we're attempting to connect your story with Jesus' story. That's what the Apostle Paul is getting at. So then, if you have, um, if you can think about uh, other people in your life, maybe. Uh, uh, children that you have, or friends that you have, uh, co-workers, um, and they, their spiritual journey has been, um, we could say, pretty dicey or pretty rocky. Sometimes they think that they're, yeah, I'm Christian, other times, no, I don't think so, and just what in the world is going on there? I think, um, I think some of that has to do with whether or not they've actually connected their story with Jesus' story. Specifically, in the idea of a fellowship of suffering with Jesus. So are they, are you, entering into, locating yourself in Christ, which means you share in his sufferings. You know him in his sufferings. You are becoming like him in his death. So that's some more kind of practical uh, things as to what we're talking about. And then last Sunday, you remember the story of Caleb? Who wasn't here last week? I'm going to take attendance. Okay, no, just to let you know. Okay, so um, let me let me read the story again. Because uh, this is, uh, this story provided some books for us last week as we're thinking through um, uh, what the Jacob looks like. Okay? Living and dying with Jesus in everyday life. Okay, so here's the story of Caleb. Um, this is the shorter one. He said, Kayla raised money and gave up a week of her time to go work as a short-term missionary at a summer camp for families affected by disability. At the camp, volunteers like Kayla serve families and those affected um, by disability. It's hard but rewarding work. You're part of a team that is embodying the love of Jesus. 
Well, on the second day of camp, a mother claimed that Kayla had said something negative about her parenting. The mother went to the camp directors who investigated the allegation. Kayla had no recollection of saying anything. Multiple people were involved, and there was no resolution. On Wednesday, she came to my wife and me completely distraught. We didn't think Kayla had said this, but there was no way of proving it. The camp leadership handled the situation as best they could, but no matter what they did, a cloud hung over Kayla. Okay, so um, some of the details that we didn't, uh, that we left out in this shorter story was the cost that Kayla put forth to go to serving camp. So it cost her 500 bucks to go and serve at camp, uh, cost her a week for vacation. And if you remember um, from last week, uh, if you don't, it's okay, we're, we're uh, unfolding it again today. Um, from Monday and Tuesday, things were okay, and so whatever happened on Tuesday happened. And then Wednesday, it seemed like everything changed because there was this great uh, cloud of uncertainty around her and everybody else around her. So we talked about what does the rest of camp serving for Caleb that week look like in the midst of this unrest. And so um, we asked the questions last, last week, and uh, give me some interaction here if you would. Um, what, what do you, if you were in Kayla's shoes, what would it be like for you in the midst of giving up uh, 500 bucks a week of your vacation, um, be there and to finish out the week of camp? She finished and stayed it out. She stuck it out. So what, what are some of the things that she may be processing through as we're thinking about what does it mean to be a, a follower of Jesus and, and joining with him in his sufferings of dying and rising. Let's just talk about what does it look like for her to finish out the week with the people around her? Annette? Um, letting herself know that Jesus is her vindicator. Mm -hmm. That she can be free to continue what she's doing. Okay, yeah. So, um, before we miss the, the huge uh, the huge point that she needs to make, Kayla does in that situation, she needs to locate herself where? Jesus. You just said it, right? right? Like all of those things that we sometimes come naturally out of our mouths, like we just did. But what is what has to happen before we start to talk that way? There's something that takes place in our heart that Kayla is a believer knows that where is my vindication? With all of these, with the camp staff and all the people here? No, right? I mean, is that okay? That would be nice, but ultimately, as Annette said, her vindication, her justification has been given to her by what Christ has done. So, God sees, right, and sees the situation, okay? And so that's what she can, again, she finished out the week of camp, that's what she uh, had to um, tell herself, to preach to herself in order to do that, okay? That's what you say something? Just the whole dying self. Yeah. That, that thing doesn't feel quite right in our humanity, right? Yeah. But it's important. Yeah, so there's a, um, I'm going to put words in your mouth if I do. Yeah. So there's a wrestling that takes place, right? Because uh, because it's some strange thing to talk about wanting to suffer. Can we just agree on that? Right? Like naturally, what do we want to do with suffering? Avoid it, right? Okay. But. If there's a, another story, a bigger story, a better story being told that we can enter into, then that's that's what that's what being a Christian is. We're Jesus, right? Take up your cross and follow me, right? So it locates it there. Um, and I don't want us to be too quick to pass over what it must be like for her to stand in that line and to serve food to people who think what of her. Ill of her, right? So it doesn't say everybody was, but it seems like a majority of the people were. So, you know, some side eyes, some sighs, some, you know, just misunderstanding, right? That never feels good. Okay, if she were to locate herself in another story, like let's just say the story of her flesh, how would that unfold for her? Compared to contrast with locating herself in Jesus, yeah. Feel like I made all these sacrifices of money and time and vacation. Yeah. All for what? I mean, yeah. She was looking in the flesh world for gratitude. For those yeah. Like 
Yes. So, yeah, right. So, um, from Monday to Tuesday, she had that, a transaction going on. And it wasn't a bad transaction. She was giving up herself, and as what was just said, she was receiving from the camp of people gratitude and thanks and encouragement. Come Wednesday, what is she receiving? Accusations. Accusations, right? Shame. Scorn. Misunderstanding, right? Chaos. Okay. If she were to operate in the flesh and not in Christ, what might she have done? I'm out of here. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right? Gone. Right? Because if we're operating in the flesh, right, remember the failure of boasting chart? We're, we're either in Christ or we're not. So if I'm in that moment as a believer, and I'm not saying we lose our salvation, I'm saying this is Romans 7, we wrestle with our flesh. If in that moment we forget to locate ourselves in Jesus, and we just locate ourselves in the flesh, then my 500 bucks and my vacation time is not getting me where I want to be a here. Okay, so that's, that's where the flesh lives. It, it wants to be fed. All right? That's why Jesus came and said, I'm the what of life. I'm the bread of life. Because I know that you need to be fed. I'm going to feed you with something far better than what the flesh wants. Right? Mike? I was just going to say, uh, I think if you get past that, uh, <laughs> the next thing to me is it becomes, you start to feel sorry for yourself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Mike only, right, in that? Start to feel, no, well, we all do that, right? We begin to feel sorry for myself. Um, that sorry, that pity for ourselves usually doesn't just stay isolated. We begin to share that with who? Everybody around us. And then all of a sudden, we may not have consciously thought, I'm going to revile because I was reviled, but what do we begin to do? That, right? So, so this, this story, again, just helps us to uh, see um, how following Jesus in everyday life really is important for us to get a hold of. Okay, so um, we need to be connecting our story with Jesus's, um, aka a fellowship of suffering. So this is what I want us to do. This is some of the um, bonus material. And if it stinks, don't blame Paul Miller. This is for me. Okay, so um, look at Luke chapter 9, 23 and 24. And again, what I want to do um, with, with this uh, additional lesson is just to show you other places in Scripture where this idea of fellowship of suffering is on display for us. Okay, so this isn't just, this study isn't just some new kind of cute way of talking about stuff that I thought we should do. It's a, it's a helpful way of taking what's in the Word and, and giving us different languages for it. Okay, so I just want you, with the rest of us, to come together and see where this is in Scripture. So, Luke chapter 9, 23 and 24. Somebody read that for us. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, then deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Okay, so... Dave, or anyone else, what what is some language in there that we can connect with what Paul the Apostle must be talking about when he talks about this fellowship of suffering? Really familiar verses, right? 23 and 24 in Luke chapter 9. What are some words that he uses here when we think about connecting this to living and dying with Jesus? Deny yourself. yourself. You don't deny yourself. You haven't got a chance. Okay, so denying self, all right? Let's use some of the Right, Dave, use some of the specific words that Luke uses. Tim? Take up your cross daily. Okay. Take up your cross daily. Okay. So, remember what Paul talks about in Philippians 3, becoming like him in his death. Okay. So, we're, hopefully, you're, are you seeing the connection there? So, here's Jesus. For those who want to follow him, deny yourself and take up your cross daily. Okay, anything else in there? Follow me. Say it again. Follow me. Okay, follow me. All right, so um, that then helps us uh, make sense of where Paul will say um, in another place, imitate or follow me as I imitate or follow who? Christ. Christ. Right, so 
what kind of following and imitate me and what is he talking about specifically in Luke chapter 9, 23 and 24? Try not to be Captain Obvious here, but okay. just so we're all coming together. Follow me in what way? Suffering? Yeah, suffering, right? Um, who wants to pick up a cross? I don't. But what did Jesus show us it led to? Well, the salvation that he accomplished for us and his resurrection. Right? Okay. Uh, look at Romans chapter 8, uh, 18 through 23. And the volunteer to read that one for us. 18 to 23, Romans chapter 8. Anyone? For I consider that the sufferings of this one. present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. How far am I going? Uh, 23, please. Sorry. For we know that the whole creation have been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Okay, thanks, Michelle. So, <clears throat> pull out some words in verses 18 to 23 that we can categorize under what Paul is talking about, the fellowship of suffering. Eager longing. Okay, eager longing. Okay. What's the, yeah, what, what does that um, speak to if we were going to hang it on the hook of dying or rising? Which one? Waiting. An eager longing for our rising. Right? Okay. Yeah, the waiting. Yep, Claudia. Anything else in here? Okay, good. Yeah, a glory that's to be revealed. And creation itself will be set free from its bondage. Yeah, so creation itself will be will be set free in that. Okay. Yeah, so um, um, more uh, ideas in there. You see glory, you see groaning, you see waiting. Okay, again, these things that we uh, hear Paul is writing to this a uh, group of Christians in Rome, and he's giving them these categories that we're talking about and what it looks like in this J-curve. Uh, fellowship of suffering. We're sharing with Jesus in that. That's what it, it's, it's going to give shape to your life as a, as a Christian. Okay, look at 2 Corinthians 4, 7-12. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7-12. A great Christian rock band got their name on this verse. <laughs> Anybody's doing Christian music, Jeopardy. Oh, okay, someone uh, read that one for us. But we have the, this treasure in dark or clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken. Okay, so specifically in the context here, Paul's talking about himself and his co-laborers and what they were going through. The suffering that they were enduring was producing what in those they were serving? At the end of verse 12. Death for them, for Paul and his co-workers, but what for life for them, right? So, again, remember, and we'll talk about towards the end of our time together today, but um, our fellowship of suffering as Christians, um, we do not pick
pick uh, how we die, and we do not pick how we rise. Those things are set in our lives and upon us by the Lord and His sovereignty. So we don't choose what the Lord sets in front of us. It's, it's by God and His grace that He brings these things to us. But what we can know, though, in that is that dying will always be, because of Jesus being united to Him, will lead in resurrection. So that's what Paul's talking about at the end. Any, what else do you notice in 7 to 12? Some, some words, uh, some back and forth. What's the, talk to me about that, that theme. There's a couple of themes going on there. There's a back and forth. There's a negative. Yeah. But it's contrasted with the positive. Yeah, there's a negative and a positive, right? So uh, afflicted in every way, negative, but the positive is what? Not crushed. Not crushed, okay? The negative, perplexed, but what? Not driven to despair. Right? Negative, persecuted, but not forsaken. Okay? Struck down, negative, but not destroyed. And always carrying, this is interesting, right? Always carrying in the body what? The death of Jesus. Why? So that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. So he's talking about the shape of our lives looks like. Jesus is specifically in his dying rising. So a follower of Jesus is one who has believed upon Jesus for salvation and one who has entered into the gospel story. So it gives shape to our lives. It begins to help us, like Caleb, make sense of. Now we don't, we're not trying to make sense of why God is doing what he's doing, right? We can't. But Locating ourselves in Jesus and with the purpose of our salvation and the way that he is working all things together for our good does help us to make sense of the fact that, oh, I remember when Jesus said, if you want to follow me, consider the cost, because you have to take up your cross daily and deny yourself, all right, and enter into this fellowship of suffering with me. And as we enter into it, like Caleb did in our story, how does that help her in her relationship with Jesus? Just talk about that for a quick second here. Of the three, back to Philippians 3, don't turn there, just let me give these words again. Knowing, sharing, and becoming. Of those three words, which one would you say Kayla experiences maybe more of her, yeah, which word would you say Kayla experiences in that moment when she locates herself in Jesus? <clears throat> no. Okay, I, I would agree. I, I think that there's, I, you, you heard me hesitate, because I think we can see all three of those there. But I think mainly it grows her knowledge of Jesus. And when the Bible talks about knowing, there's knowing and there's knowing. There's an intellectual type of knowledge. But when the Bible speaks of knowing, it's in a relational um, understanding and concept. So yeah, as Caleb is going through that, and she thinks about, oh, what must it have been like for Jesus to come and to give? I gave 500 bucks in a week of my time. What did Jesus give me? And Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't kind of send us and say, yeah, that's nothing, right? But he says, yes, right? So I, you, you begin to experience at least a little bit and taste what it was like for me to do that. What does that do with our heart? Oh, it causes us to grow and, and to rejoice in what Jesus has done for me. Wow. So without the suffering, I wouldn't have that. But what's also really cool about Scripture is that it, it helpfully balances it, that we aren't weirdos looking for suffering. When Paul got the tar beat out of him, he left the city, right? Okay, so we, it, it helps us to balance suffering where we realize that just like this Advent season, we are acknowledging that we are in a period of waiting. And in that period of waiting, we will have suffering. Now, is that, just un is that just that believers will have suffering? No. No. Everybody has sufferings. But to locate ourselves in Jesus, which is why we want to bring our unbelieving family and friends, one of the many reasons why we want to see them come to know Jesus is because it, helped, it locates us. It gives us grounding. It gives us joy and hope in the midst of our suffering. 
Okay, so let's uh, look at Colossians 1.24. Remember, Gentiles eat pork chops as you're trying to find your way through Galatians, Ephesians, and Colossians. Go okay. eat real potato chips. Come again? Go eat real potato chips. Wow, that was yours? After that. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay, Colossians 1 24. Let me read this one for us. <clears throat> so here's Paul again. And he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, the body, he's not talking about flesh in a negative sense there, he's talking about his body. I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Okay. What in tarnation is he talking about there? Now, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church. And the ideas in that. Why is this a difficult one for us to think through? What are some of the concepts that he's talking about that causes us to scratch our brain and say, scratch our head and think, what? Tim? So, Christ's death on the cross is totally sufficient for our salvation. That's already been achieved. Preach on, brother. So, I, I don't know about the next part, but I'm just saying that it's not saying that Jesus' death was lacking. Yeah, yes, and we know that because Scripture gives us the language for that, not our theological mm-hmm. convictions that we've come up with, right? So, Jesus' suffering was complete. Okay, so what is lacking? And that? Would it show that he would have done this? You know, if he were still here? Oh, would, does it show that would Jesus have done this? Is that what you're saying? I'm doing what Jesus would have done or how he would have responded. Okay, I, I, I don't think that's wrong. Mm-hmm. That's my way of saying it. I'm not sure about it. Uh, I don't think it's wrong um, because as we follow Jesus, Jesus would have done that, right? He would have suffered for the sake of others. Um, some things that we do know, though, uh, as Tim said, and as uh, pointing to Scripture, like the writer of Hebrews says, Christ suffered how many times? Once for, Once for all, accomplishing salvation. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Okay, so the lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, I think what Paul is talking about here is the fact that in God's purposes for the unfolding of redemption, he will, um, he does have a category for us as his people that we need to fill up. And then the end will come. So, I don't know if I have this one down. I do. Revelation 6.10. So just kind of keep your thought there in Colossians 1.24 as we turn to an even more um, understandable place in the Bible, Revelation. Uh, Revelation, it's a fun one, right? It's a mix of sci-fi and then a literal letter to some literal churches. So anyways. Um, Revelation 6.10 says this, speaking at the... Uh, at the end of it all, um, uh, back up to verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for what? The word of God and for the witness they had borne. So, the work of the church, right? In verse 10, they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they are each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until what? The number of fellow servants and their brethren will be filled even as they have been to be completed also. Okay, so um, I think there's a couple things going on in the lacking of Christ's sufferings. I think we can be confident that nothing was lacking in the suffering of Jesus to bring us salvation. Okay, but there is something in Scripture to be said about following Jesus is to suffer. So the Lord knows that. That's what he calls us into. As we follow him in this fellowship of sufferings, his purposes of redemption continue to unfold. 
And, but not until the end that his purposes are accomplished will it be done. So I think that's what Paul is getting at in Colossians. I think, um, I think that passage in Revelation speaks to that. Until their number is completed, so there's something that's lacking until it's complete. So I think it's this idea of following Jesus and entering into the fellowship of suffering that is going on there in Colossians. Ryan, did you have a comment or a thought on that? Well, no, I was just Put your hand down, you know, now I... No, I was so like, finished, but yeah, no, so the, uh, I was reading some notes in here about, uh, obviously what was lacking was, you know, after, after uh, the cross, they started persecuting, you know, anybody preaching the gospel. Yeah. But he was also doing that for the benefit of the church. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's why, I, yeah, that passage in Colossians talks about those two things that they were being martyred for. Right, uh, it's the, the word of God and the declaration of that, which would yeah, make sense of that. Yeah, Dan. Well, I, um, in the context that Christ it was required by the Father that He suffer, and that He is the suffering servant. He has to actually die to achieve salvation, right? and, and for who? For the church, which is the key. Right? Yeah. Yeah. He chooses to work through us. Yeah. And that is through suffering in order to bring people to salvation. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's good. That's helpful too in connecting it to the Father because as we become like Jesus in his death, what did Jesus do as he felt the weight of the cross? He prayed to his father for what? Yeah, another way. But if not he entrusted himself to the Father, knowing the Father's heart for him and his plan, right? So as we enter into that with Jesus, then us too can know that, okay, so nothing happens by coincidence, right? God is sovereign. He appoints everything. So this thing that I'm going through in my life right now, as a follower of Jesus, I have to connect it to what he calls me to. And as I connect it to that, I don't know what he's going to do through this, but I can entrust myself to him. I know that resurrection can come from this. It came for um, Kayla um, in the fact that she became, um, uh, instead of, um, I'll just use some scripture uh, terminology here, instead of being a stench of death to those around her by saying, forget all of you, I'm bailing and heading home, right? She sticks it out and actually I think becomes an aroma of life. She begins to say to other by her actions, and people look at her and say, wow, I can't believe that she's, you know, what's up with that? And then we can get to where Peter talks about, so, you know, we live in such a way that people want to know, what is that difference in you? And there gives us an opportunity to, to talk to them about the reason for our hope. So that, I think that's just one of the, one of the ways for Kayla that it led to um, um, resurrection. Okay, so... Um, let's be back in Philippians, meet me back in Philippians for our last uh, seven minutes here. We already looked at the second passage, chapter 3, 10 to 11, but I uh, uh, don't want us to miss this one. And I want you, as I read this, I want you to know what's kind of interesting about the way that Paul talks about this. Um, it's not uncommon to the way that he already talked about the passages that we uh, looked at already today. So, Philippians 1.29, Paul says this, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also, what? Suffer for his sake. What's a, what, is there a word in 29? I'm um, asking you to think what is my thinking game here. But uh, is there a word in there that sticks out to you in verse 29? Yeah, I mean, me too. Right, as you read that. What has been granted to you? Yeah, for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him. So there's the reality that a Christian is not one who just believes, but one who enters into the gospel story. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. 
So for Kayla and for us, connecting her story with Jesus's gives her a gospel-shaped life. Uh, by locating herself in Christ, she can see her situation as a way into the sufferings of Christ as she endures in love without reward. Does that remind you of anybody? Jesus, but he did get his reward, right? So we're wanting to be careful here. She's becoming like him in his death, right? She's giving up. She's willing to be misunderstood. It's not easy, right? Um, falsely accused. But continuing to serve. Uh, she can expect a resurrection. I mentioned this just a minute ago. Instead of reviling and revile, she can see this as an opportunity to become like Christ and treat the accusing woman with kindness while being prudent. That's uh, important, those last three words there. Because how do our accusers usually um, interact with us? Harshly. Okay, and we just have to be wise and prudent with how we engage with them. We don't want to engage with kindness in order to rub their nose in it. That's our flesh rising up, right? So we want to do it with prudence and care. Uh, she's becoming like Christ by being humbled, by going lower, and losing her position of standing among those around her. I mean, does that remind you of anything? Of anyone? She's becoming like Christ, being humbled. Philippians 2, even though Jesus was in the very form of God, what did he do? Uh, he didn't consider that something to be grasped or held on to. So, Kayla, I'm not considering the 500 bucks that I shelled out my week of vacation something to be grasped. I'm willing to, I don't know what the Lord is doing, but I'm willing to be here and serve. By locating herself in Christ instead of in camp, her whole story of camp is reframed. So, this, this one of instead of locating yourself in Christ instead of in camp was another lesson that we talked about, right? Because our flesh is pretty wily, um, and we can begin to say, but I'm locating myself in camp, that must be a good thing, um, but if it's in camp and not in Christ, that's not a good thing. Um, we can locate ourselves in family, um, after the holidays, you may not want to, but you can locate yourself in your family, right? Um, but if that begins to what you, if family is, uh, begins to be what you live for, that's not a good thing. Uh, you can locate yourself in ministry, you can locate yourself in lots of things, but remember, you can only locate yourself in Christ or in something else. So for Kayla, the challenge was, I don't want to locate myself in camp, even though camp's a good thing, I want to locate myself in Jesus. And that's going to allow her then to continue to serve out her sentence at camp. What might feel like a sentence, but serve out the last couple of days of camp and leave it and trust all of this with who? With God. He, and like the writer of Hebrews says, as Claudia just said, Jesus knows what that's like, right? Because we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with us, right? But one who took on flesh and knows what it's like. All right. So um, uh, the J curve. The J curve idea helps us to see our circumstances from a different perspective. But while we gradually begin to shape our lives this way, we need to remember a couple of things. The dying and rising of Jesus is not ours to control. Rather, the timing and the type of each is God's to control. An example of this, uh, missionaries are prepared to lay down their lives for those they're sent to serve, but what about the ones on their team? Actually, the way that Paul Miller put this is, but what about the idiots they're out there serving with? And he's, 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 he's saying it that way because we can be sent out with a team. Let's just say you're a missionary, you're going out with a team. The heartbeat of the team is for the sake of the gospel. I'm willing to lay down my life for the people I'm going there to serve. But where do we live? We live with this team, and all of us are battling our flesh. So you could have many Kayla situations on the mission field, and if you're not connecting yourself to Jesus in this reality that I can't pick and choose how I die and rise, if we entrust that to God, then that means that I'm not only willing to lay down my life for these people that I've come to serve, but also for the people that I'm with, right? Um, a, a lot of, I wouldn't say most of the time, but isn't it 
the people that are closest to us sometimes, but a lot of the chaos stuff happens in life. Our, the neighbors that are closest to us, where we can say, I've got my mind made up and I'm going to lay down my life for the Lord is like, but don't forget about those neighbors who are closest to you. Um, the same is true of us, like our missionary friends. We're often ready to serve strangers, but like I just said, how about those closest to us? Um, okay, so we'll close with this screen here. Uh, on the larger scale of human suffering, Caleb's struggle is relatively mild. It'll be over in a couple of days. Everyone will go their separate ways. Nevertheless, her story is, a help, is helpful for us because it is in these relatively small incidents where we often struggle, that should say, to live out our faith. The accumulated slights of low-level suffering can operate like a hidden cancer, souring our relationships and eventually our souls. So I think uh, what a good one for us as we head into the holiday season, whatever that looks like for you, um, happy, sad, disappointments, and to remember that while on a larger scale, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to human suffering, but God and his sovereignty is at work in us and through us. We are jars of clay, 2 Corinthians, to show that the surpassing power belongs to who? Not to me, or to us, but to God. So let me just encourage you, and I'll, I'll pray towards the set as we head into um, holiday seasons, and then into the new year, to, to be praying and working uh, towards connecting your story, our story, as a Five Points Community Church, into Jesus' story. And as we do so, we can be um, uh, encouraged that we begin to uh, have the, the joy of connecting ourselves and motivating ourselves in Christ and not in things that truly um, pale in comparison to God. You know. So let me pray for us and, and we'll be dismissed. So God, we do thank you that you are at work in us and through us. And we thank you that as you are doing that, that you have given us uh, Jesus and you have given us his story, uh, preserved it for us down through the ages so that we can have a copy of it on our laps right now. And so we thank you that your spirit comes along too and takes these many, uh, these are truths that um, most of us, I would imagine, have heard for a really long time. But uh, we just, we pray that you would help us to continue to grow in understanding what it means to um, not only believe the gospel, but to enter into it. Um, as we have just considered uh, knowing and sharing and becoming like Jesus in his death, help us to uh, be mindful of that in the um, circumstances that you and your sovereignty uh, will place in our lives even today, um, throughout the week. Uh, may we be attentive uh, to you at work. May your spirit help to remind us um, of our need to uh, locate ourselves in Jesus. And uh, from that position, we thank you for the perspective that that will um, bring to us. And we look forward to seeing all the many different resurrections that will come of it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody.